Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our MHRC seminar this afternoon. My name is David Hood. It's a pleasure to introduce our guest this afternoon, Dr. Mark Haikowski from the University of Alberta. I'll give you a little bit of background on Mark. He's uh, an Alberta lad for sure. He did his uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD at the University of Alberta, the latter degree in uh, the Department of Physical Education. He then did a postdoctoral fellowship in cardiology and heart failure, also at U of A. He worked there in the physical therapy department uh, for a period of time, and then he was recruited to the University of Texas at Arlington, where he spent four to five years and had an endowed chair there, but was lured back to the University of Alberta with another endowed chair uh, in uh, aging and uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, and he's now in the faculty of nursing there. Uh, and uh, in total, he's been at the University of Alberta for 16 or 18 years. He's a full professor. He tells me he's a huge Edmonton Oilers fan. And I said, we wouldn't hold that against him. Uh, and that's okay. We're looking forward to his talk on exercise limitations in heart failure and preserved ejection fraction control role of the periphery. So Mark, if you wouldn't mind, please, uh, Turn on your camera and let's share some slides. Share some slides with us, please. And we'll take it away. Well, thanks, David. Pleasure to uh, be here. And uh, can you see my slides there? Or are they perfect? Yeah, yep, we're good. So, we're um, good. Yep. Excellent. So, so, make, them uh, bigger, make them bigger, Mark, uh, if you can. Go to the full full screen. Oh, there. OK, yeah, we're now on the full screen. Perfect. Uh, yep. I think you can see it. Great, thanks. So uh, yes, I'll talk a little bit about exercise and HEFPEF and breast cancer and uh, how they're similar. Um, no disclosures other than David has alluded to, I'm a big Oilers fan, but we're uh, having a few losses. So uh, yeah, it's been stressful the last few days, but uh, we'll get over that. So in the next 45 minutes, I'll just highlight a little bit about exercise limitations in heart failure and preserved ejection fraction in breast cancer and uh, in heart failure and cardio-oncology has been a major focus on the heart, but uh, some of the work we've done is suggesting that maybe we should focus on non-cardiac factors. So just uh, for those who are not familiar with the heart failure um, sort of theme, this is from American Heart, American College of Cardiology. They have the stages and evolution of heart failure, and they base it on risk factors, uh, where the heart has changed its shape or remodeled, and symptoms. So stage A is uh, individuals who are at risk for heart failure. So high blood pressure, increased body mass index, obesity, diabetes, or underlying coronary disease. And uh, what's really interesting and specifically related to this talk is they also highlight adjuvant and biological therapy for cancer therapy. So in stage A, there's no uh, LV remodeling, the heart doesn't change its shape, and these individuals have no symptoms. And there are some similarities between HEFPEF and uh, breast cancer survivors in that they're often older, um, females, uh, sedentary lifestyle is a major independent risk factor for both heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, and breast cancer, and again, obesity and, and higher blood pressure. Then stage B is just where the heart has changed its shape a little bit. So maybe you've had a heart attack or some valvular disease or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, but you have no heart failure symptoms. And majority of the work that we've done are in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, so big dilated hearts or preserved ejection fraction where the heart is uh, increased mass and the walls are thick and stiff, non-compliant and paired ventricular vascular coupling. And the hallmark features of, of heart failure with reduced to preserved ejection fraction are uh, you know, dyspnea on exertion, uh, fatigue, and, and the hallmark feature is low um, exercise tolerance, especially at low workloads. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then stage D, for those who are, who are not familiar, this is where you've exhausted all medical therapies. So maybe you've had a left ventricular assist device or ECMO, and as a result, uh, just, just not able to, to, to get to alleviate those symptoms and require transplantation. So we're also really interested in the last two decades on sort of the super physiology of individuals who have had uh, heart transplantation. And uh, we, we've published in the 50th anniversary of the, of the first heart transplant that was done December 3rd, 1967. We were asked by circulation to write a little uh, mini review on uh, upper limits of human performance. And this individual is named Eleanor Sprink. And he's one of three individuals we highlighted in that little um, uh, review. And he's the fittest heart transplant alive. He's, he's now uh, 
to a decade post-transplant and he's competed in over 150, 200, the most uh, difficult endurance races in, in the world. And he just competed two weeks ago at the Utah race at 70.3 World Championships where he qualified and he beat two thirds of, uh, um, or a third, he, he, he uh, beats a third of all the people who qualified. So maybe another talk I could talk about upper limits post-transplant, uh, but not today. So um, just a few things about our, our group that you may or may not be aware of. We do a lot of advanced imaging. So some of the things we do, we try to do most of our work in the MR environment. So we're very interested in uh, exercise MR. So here's just the ergo spec where you can do stepping, but uh, Steve Folks who's gonna talk a little bit later. Uh, we also have a cycle ergometer loading that we can do maximal exercise. So we get people to exercise uh, uh, submaximal maximally in the magnet, and we can look at their biventricular function. We can look at their left ventricle, their right ventricle, and their uh, ventricular vascular coupling. And here's just showing a slide of an individual at rest of 4, 57 beats per minute, and then as high as 270 watts. Now, it's not the 600 watts that we see in the elite athletes uh, because your supine is very difficult to do this kind of exercise, but 275 uh, watts is pretty, pretty, pretty remarkable in the magnet where we can get biventricular function. You can just see that heart contracting very nicely in the left and right sides uh, and the ejection fraction going up from 59 to 75%. So as I said, in, in, in heart failure in particular, HEFPEF world, we focus primarily on the heart as well as in cardio-oncology the primary sort of metrics that they measure are your left ventricular ejection fraction. So that's just the amount of blood you pump out of your heart relative to the amount of blood that came back to your heart and uh, a measure of left ventricular strain. That's just sort of a longitudinal measure of, of ejection fraction. But the trouble with that is if you want to elicit heart dysfunction, you really need to stress people. So we're big advocates of exercise. A limitation, it is supine exercise, but we're not that stressed because the, the heart is loaded in the supine position. Also, we do some work uh, looking at the skeletal muscle oxygenation and quality. So we come up with some techniques, I think, that are quite novel. Uh, very interesting. We do knee extension exercise, but in the last few years, we've been doing a lot of plantar flexion uh, because when we do small muscle mass exercise where less than five kilograms is engaged in, in the movement, the heart's never limiting. Even in our heart transplant recipients, they can deliver enough blood to the, to the calf muscle. So then we can really look at what is the weak link of the muscle. So we do some measures to look at the muscle quality or myosteatosis, which you can see on the right here, where we can see the fat infiltration. And we do some phase contrast with some techniques called MR susceptometry, which is right here in the middle. So if you look at this little blue here, we can, we can measure the venous saturation. We know the arterial saturation from the finger, so we can actually get the arterial venous oxygen difference. We know flow. So now we can actually measure muscle VO2 and we could do some um, sort of surrogate measures of muscle oxygen diffusive conductance. So I'll, measure, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight that a little bit later, but that's just the transport of oxygen from the red blood cell and the microvasculature to the muscle mitochondria. So uh, just getting back to the topic at hand, why should we really be interested in heart failure and breast cancer? Well, the prevalence of known heart failure is estimated to be around one to 2% of the general adult population in developed countries. And importantly, over 50% of our heart failure patients have preserved ejection fraction. So we call these HEFPEF. And among older women, over 80% of our new cases are HEFPEF. And why this is an important uh, group to study is because all the therapies, except recent data with the SGLT2 inhibitors, really all the therapies that have been successful in improving survivorship in HEFREF, the big dilated heart, uh, don't improve survivorship in HEFREF. So we really don't have... Uh, uh, that many therapies to, to improve overall survivorship. Again, these are often older women. They're, they're hypertensive. They're obese, especially in the South where I lived in Texas and work I've done in North Carolina. And often they may have some atrial fibrillation. Sort of changing gears a little bit as well, when we start looking at breast cancer, as you are likely aware, breast cancer is the most common uh, malignancy and the leading cause of cancer death among women worldwide. And in US and Canada, breast cancer mortality has decreased by about you know, 40 to 50% in the last four decades as a result of novel screening and novel biological and chemotherapy agents. But interestingly, a lot of people are kind of surprised and shocked to hear this. So in early stage disease where the tumor is not spread, what we're finding is that cardiovascular disease and in particular heart failure and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is the leading cause of mortality in older survivors. 
So women are likely to survive their breast cancer if it's not advanced or metastatic, only to die of, of heart failure, in particular HEFPEF. And I can't emphasize that enough. Currently in cardio-oncology, we're doing resting measures to look at drops in ejection fraction. But I have to highlight again that our HEFPEF patients have normal EFs. They don't have normal hearts, but they do have normal ejection fraction. So if you're only looking for drops in LV or RV ejection fraction, we're potentially missing 50% of our patients who may be future HEFPEF, which is quite ominous. So a hallmark feature of both breast cancer and heart failure is reduced exercise tolerance. So this is a paper we published a decade ago in JCO, a really good uh, oncology journal with Lee Jones and, and some of my colleagues. And what we found is that when we measure the pulmonary oxygen uptake on the cycle ergometer upright, we had women at N of 248, so before therapy, and again, this is cross-sectional design, during treatment, after treatment, and advanced disease metastatic setting. And what we see across the board is the peak VO2 is around 17 mils per kg. So that's about a mil below the threshold for independent living. And I know Scott Trappy had spoke a few weeks ago at your last seminar. He likely talked about the friend database and aging and, and VO2 and master athletes. But we're seeing peak VO2s in our breast cancer survivors that are what we typically see in our heart failure patients, yet these women have no heart failure at all. Uh, and the lowest VO2 is during treatment. So you, your fitness declines by about a decade on therapy and in the metastatic disease. And really important for survivorship in the metastatic setting, we found that women have a VO2 peak in absolute units of 1.09 liters per minute or less and a more ominous survivorship, higher mortality rate. So even getting women above a VO2 peak of one liter per minute or over 18 mils is really, really gonna be important for survivorship in advanced disease. This is probably a slide that uh, you have seen with Scott with his database uh, looking at the, at the master athletes, but these are all the women I just described uh, previously on the left slide, and this is all the data of the 248. Here's the regression equation for the healthy sedentary from uh, Tanaka at UT Austin in a meta-analysis, and here's our regression line in blue for our, our women with breast cancer across the survivorship continuum. And what we found in a number of studies, including this, is, uh, is that up to 63% of uh, women that we test have a VO2 peak below 18 mils per kg or below the 3LT threshold. And really importantly, kind of surprised us because I was worried about the older survivor. Well, we started looking at the data. If you look at our regression line for a 40-year-old and match it to the age uh, match and sex predicted value, our, our women look like they're 30 years older. So the only studies that I can find are that are Bank Saltine and Jerry Mitchell and, and the follow-up studies by Ben Levine looking at 20, 30 days of bed rest. So, so we see this accelerated physiologic aging in a number of our breast cancer survivors, uh, which really worries us because it's not great to have a 40-year-old who's got a VO2 around 18 mils. So why is that? Well, this is a slide that we often show, and it's just some data that uh, uh, Reese Beaudry was a PhD student with me at the time in Texas, that we had some women who are not a, not a large N, but it's one of the largest N for, for women who are older. So they're 67 years of age, and they were almost a decade post chemo. Again, no heart failure, no heart failure symptoms. Uh, but interestingly, their VO2 peak is not that different from what we see in my colleague's lab at the Mass General, Greg Lewis, when they do invasive hemodynamic uh, measurements with pulmonary oxygen uptake, around 15.9 versus 15 mils per kg. So a few things are obvious from this slide. Their VO2 is well below the threshold for independent living. And secondly, we see the various activities of daily living. So putting on a pair of shoes, climbing stairs, all the way to sweeping the floor. These are the oxygen costs if you go to the y-axis here around nine mils per kg, and you can see this will increase depending on the basic or recreational ADL. But here's the percentage that it requires these individuals to perform these activities of daily living. So our HEFPEF or our breast cancer survivors, just putting on a pair of socks and putting a shoe, your shoes on is around 60 to 65% of your peak VO2, and sweeping is around 90 to 95 and I like showing this slide to the cardiac rehab uh, sort of group because they often prescribe exercise at 60, 80% of your peak power output or heart rate or reserve. But if you go on the lower end, that's just basically your rehab is putting your shirt on and off. So we sometimes fail miserably in rehab because we're looking at, you know, a certain absolute number of value for percentage of your, 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 your peak value without realizing that if your fitness is very, very low, just sitting at rest is, is exercise training. And some of our heart failure patients are exhausted at rest. 
So I think this is an important slide. And in fact, we're advocates of doing interval training because they're walking anaerobes are heart failure patients and breast cancer survivors with low fitness because just doing daily tasks, you know, they do a little burst for 30 seconds, they sit down for three minutes. They do a little burst, they sit down. So depending on their off and off, uh, on and off kinetics, uh, they may sit longer. So this is just a nice uh, review, I think, a little bit biased on my part, that we, we looked at the hemodynamic studies that were published to date, and most are from our lab uh, here or, or in Texas, uh, looking at relative or to age match controls that we studied. I've just put their scores or values uh, as far as VO2 and the thick principal determinants relative to the controls. And you can see across the board the peak VO2 uh, even prior to, which I didn't show in the slide, or one, three, or 10 years post anthracycline chemotherapy is markedly lower as a result of lower cardiac output, uh, despite the arterial venous oxygen difference being relatively normal. But I'm going to come back to that because often people assume with a thick principle, if that the arterial venous oxygen difference is normal or oxygen extraction is normal, that there's no peripheral non-cardiac limitation. And it's important that we look at fixed law of diffusion, as Peter Wagner has advocated for two to three decades, to really uncouple the, the, the peripheral limitations at the muscle level. Uh, so I'll come back to that in a few minutes. And this is just some data with women with HEFPEF, although it appears that there's a lot higher prevalence of HEFPEF in older women, believe it or not, there's not very many hemodynamic studies looking at what are the limitations to exercise in older HEFPEF women. And not unlike breast cancer, the VO2 is lower, stroke volume is lower, AVO2 may be preserved a little bit lower. But unlike women with breast cancer, their heart rates are, 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 are a bit higher and, and uh, sorry, a bit lower. We find that our breast cancer survivors, about a third have sinus tachycardia after therapy. So there's likely some autonomic dysfunction going on, but we've not really studied that. So this is just an exercise MR, very much like uh, I've shown in the, the, the cartoon or the video. This is just a, a slide of uh, showing that the VO2 peak of a breast cancer survivor around 20 mils per kg versus a healthy control of 24. This is the heart and end diastole and systole and rest and exercise. And there's a couple important things to highlight here. The first is, is that we seem to find this in a number of studies that we've performed is that the hearts of the women with breast cancer, even before any chemotherapy or after, or even a decade later, the hearts are a little bit smaller. And we know with age, especially in women, hearts do atrophy. So although the mass may not change, the cavity size becomes smaller and smaller chamber hearts are more stiff. So a couple of things here is that the women have lower with breast cancer have a lower end diastolic volume. Their end systolic volume is a little bit lower, uh, but overall when they exercise, their stroke volume and cardiac output are lower. So, um, but you only uncouple this if you do exercise imaging with, with MR. Um, so this is a nice review that we published with Andre Lagersh and Jason Kovacach uh, and Jack uh, about a month ago. There's a four part series in sport cardiology. And one of the reviews that we published was looking at the small heart. Everyone's familiar with the athletic heart being very compliant as Ben Levine has shown back in 1981 with invasive uh, the right heart cath and the swan gans with volume loading and unloading. Uh, but we don't often talk about this smaller heart. And smaller hearts, as I said, are less stiff or, or less compliant and more stiff in the chamber. And we also find that they also have the lowest cardiorespiratory fitness. And in our hands, we believe, in fact, they have the highest risk for HEFPEF. So then I reevaluated some of our data just at submaximal exercise for that small end of women who are a decade post chemotherapy. And two things are quite interesting. So this is just a pressure volume curve at end diastole. So here's your end diastolic volume. I've estimated end, uh, end diastolic pressure. I know there are limitations with that. We use some echo measures of EE prime. So there are some issues with respect to the type of analysis that I'm doing, but I think it's informative and uh, quite interesting. Um, so here's end, end diastole, and you see that the same end diastole filling pressure, the women with breast cancer compared to curtain controls, have a smaller ventricle. And at end systole, the, the end systolic pressure is a little bit higher. So this line here is what we call end systolic elastins. Uh, so the ventricles are not only stiffer in diastole, they're stiffer in systole. So we have impaired ventricular vascular coupling, as well as a, a, a less compliant ventricle when it's relaxing. And then if I just draw the rest of the pressure volume curve, 
you can see that one of the reasons why the stroke volume is lower in breast cancer versus control, so here's the black area, is because this curve is shifted to the left. It, it requires a much higher LA pressure to fill that ventricle, as well as when the aortic valve opens, there's, there's, there's greater stiffening in the aortic vasculature and paraventricular vascular coupling. So, so that, that's very interesting. Uh, and we see this, this is breast cancer, but we see the identical thing in HEF-PEF patients when they exercise with data from Greg Lewis, the Mass General. Now, this slide is really, I, I think, also very interesting because it's just a Wagner curve. And what Peter does is he looks at the Fick principle and the Fick's law of diffusion, and he uh, uh, integrates the two. And basically, uh, this slide is VO2 on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is just a microvascular pressure or venous pressure and arterial venous oxygen difference. And you know from the Fick principle that cardiac, uh, VO2 is equal to cardiac output uh, minus oxygen extraction. So for instance, this black line here and this purple line here, this is your, your thick principle line. So if you were to extract all the oxygen, right, from the mitochondria and the muscle uh, micro, micro vessels that are delivering that, transporting the oxygen to the muscles and the mitochondria, your O2 delivery would equal your VO2. But we know, in fact, that's never the case. There's always some venous uh, oxygen and venous oxygen content, maybe, you know, three, four, five mils. Um, and what you also find, there's also the, the fixed law of diffusion. In the fixed law of diffusion, VO2 equals this diffusive oxygen conductance, which is the transport of oxygen from this red blood cell to the muscle mitochondria. So all the inertia of that um, oxygen transport from the, from the red blood cell to the mitochondria. Um, and multiplied by the difference between the capillary pressure and mitochondrial pressure. So this line here, this, this straight line here is the diffusive oxygen conductance. And two things are uh, really noticeable from this Wagner curve when we compare our breast cancer survivors and controls is that the breast cancer survivors have lower convective O2 delivery or profusive oxygen transport, which is bulk flow to the muscles. But they also have this diffusive conductance curve that shifted down and to the right. So the transport of oxygen to the red blood cell of mitochondria is also markedly impaired. But if you only look at the thick principle, you would therefore say that this is a central limitation. There's no limitation at the periphery. Their AVO2s are normal. But in fact, when you've got greater time, uh, the thing about having a lower cardiac output blood flow is you've got more time to extract oxygen. And the fact that you can't suggests that there's a diffusive abnormalities in conductance and likely unequivocally, as Mijuel has shown, in breast cancer survivors on chemo that there's metabolic inertia at the mitochondrial level. This is a, a, a slide actually uh, from Greg Lewis's group at the Mass General with invasive right heart cath and looking at cardiac function and identical. In fact, they published this before, um, but you can see that this is the control on HEFPEF, diffusive conductance is lower, at, uh, sorry, convective O2 delivery is shifted down and this slope of this, this line to the right is shifted to the right. So the diffusive oxygen conductance in HEFPEF versus controls is also impaired. And in fact, biggest bang for your buck they found when they model, if you change cardiac output, hemoglobin, DMO2, uh, this DMO2 is the greatest bang for your buck for improving your VO2. So everything that you can improve from the red blood cell of mitochondria will give you the greatest change in your VO2 peak. Well, that's great. So I was very interested in looking at, that's whole body exercise. So what if we now look at leg plantar flexion exercise? And again, this is submaximal data. And I just reanalyzed some of our data and took a subgroup of, uh, of women who were over 60 compared to uh, with breast cancer compared to age match controls and of eight, so small numbers. Um, and they exercised at 60% of their peak power up with the plantar flexion device ergometer that I showed before. And I'm just showing this data again. This is the 100% the will be the controls and just the value of our breast cancer relative to our controls. And Russ Richardson and several papers and with Peter Wagner have, have, have shown their data like this. And I rather like this because it breaks down oxygen utilization or VO2 into transport, both convectively and diffusively, and with a thick principle called AVO2. So what we find, even at the same relative VO2, the leg VO2 is lower in the older breast cancer survivor. Why? Because they have lower convective O2 delivery at the leg. So leg blood flow and, and delivery is lower. AVO2 is not different. So again, if you would only look at the isolated plantar flexion, you'd say there's not a peripheral limitation per se at the muscle uh, interface of the microvasculature of the mitochondria. 
But when we look at this diffusive oxygen conductance, it's markedly lower. So even when the limiting role of a heart is, is minimized, we truly see that there's weak links at the muscle level. So David, it's for your group to really figure out where those limitations are to mitochondrial level because it's way beyond my expertise. But I can tell you, again, the plasticity of skeletal muscle is such that really if you want to improve fitness during chemotherapy or after or in HEFPEF patients, we really need to focus on skeletal muscle and mitochondria. Uh, so very interesting as well. So we're, we're also interested in looking at the time course of the change, again, during um, isolated exercise, during submaximal plant reflection. And we had uh, breast cancer survivors, and we're just now comparing their data from pre-change uh, or percent change from pre-chemotherapy. So we do the MEEX uh, plant reflection exercise at baseline, mid-chemotherapy. Um, so basically, that's around two or three weeks after their third cycle or nine week to 10 weeks after baseline. And then we do this at the end of chemotherapy, which is basically 24 weeks uh, from baseline. And then one year later, we bring them back. And when we uh, exercise them with the plant reflection, we see there's marked reductions in hemoglobin, very common in our breast cancer survivors during anthracycline chemotherapy or other biological therapies. But at the muscle level, the blood flow increases to compensate for that lower hemoglobin. So as a result, O2 delivery actually doesn't change that much. Uh, and that's really fascinating because this is a little bit different than we see uh, during exercise on a cycle ergometer during this, this uh, pre and post that others have published. And I showed that on the third or fourth slide. When we look at oxygen extraction, we only see a start to see a change in oxygen extraction at the end of chemotherapy in one year. You don't really have to extract as much uh, at mid-chemotherapy because your O2 delivery is increased markedly due to the marked increase in blood flow. And I find this really fascinating because if we look at muscle or lower leg VO2, it actually does not decrease in our hands, in our smaller sample, I think there was 24 in the study, uh, at mid and or one year post chemotherapy. But if you were to measure VO2 as we did pre and one year, there's almost a 10% decrease in cyclopulmonary oxygen uptake, which returns to normal a year later. So there's sort of disparity what's happening at the whole body as opposed to the muscle. Uh, now, it's interesting question would be, well, we just did plant reflection, the calf small muscle. What if we did knee extension or bilateral calf? I don't really know. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe there would be some impaired functional sympatholysis. But when you only do one leg plant reflection, isolating the calf muscle, um, muscle view two paradoxically doesn't go down like it does with whole body. So we're also interested, again, because we're not muscle physiologists like your group, uh, looking at some higher level, I would say, uh, myostatosis. And what we find is that early on during chemotherapy, within nine to 10 weeks, we start to see that there's muscle fat infiltration. And the intermuscular fat to skeletal muscle ratio is about 5% higher compared to baseline, which goes up to about 10% one year later. So this is a target that we're very interested in trying to, uh, to improve with maybe lifestyle uh, other, or, or exercise interventions during chemo. Um, and we see some subcutaneous intermuscular fat. Interestingly, it seems the muscle seems to take a bit of a hit uh, at one year and not necessarily earlier on. So why is this important? Well, we've previously shown with Delaine Kitzman at Wake and, and Pete Brubaker uh, on several studies using MRI that in our HEFPEF patients, uh, they have marked increases in intermuscular fat. So we ma match subjects for subcutaneous fat. The green is intermuscular fat and the red is skeletal muscle. And you don't have to be a trained radiologist to see that this HEFPEF patient has markedly greater uh, intermuscular fat compared to the healthy control. Uh, and that ratio is markedly higher. And what we also found, interestingly, is that this is a pretty good predictor of your peak VO2. So individuals who had the greatest thigh myosteatosis or intramuscular fat to skeletal muscle ratio had the lowest pulmonary oxygen uptake. Now, again, this is HEFPEF. I'm trying to highlight that there are similarities between HEFPEF and maybe breast cancer. So if we look at some of our breast cancer data that, uh, that uh, Reese Beaudry again and Amy Kirkham when she was doing a postdoc with our group in Alberta, now she's at U of T doing very well. Uh, we see in the thigh and the lower leg that there's greater myosteatosis. Uh, and these women were about one year post anthracycline chemotherapy. 
But not unlike our HFPEF patients, we see that those individuals who had the greatest intramuscular fat to skeletal muscle ratio had the lowest whole body pulmonary oxygen uptake. And we see this at the muscle level as well. And this is highlighted very nicely in this slide to the right, where one of our breast cancer survivors had a peak VO2 of around 41 mils per kg. And again, in the sport physiology, like that, that's not very high. But in my world for heart failure and even breast cancer, like this is awesome, 41 mils per kg. I'm used to seeing in heart failure, 9, 10, 11, 12, and even breast cancer, 20. Um, and then sort of moderate VO2 peak, you know, below the age predicted, definitely a little bit more fat in, in the thigh. And then look at the individual who's got a VO2 at the frailty threshold, just infiltrated with a lot of fat, 42% thigh, thigh muscle fat fraction and one of the lowest peak VO2s. So again, we think this is an important target of, of, of lifestyle intervention and therapies on and off therapy for breast cancer. Um, so, and then I'll just show this slide because this is uh, something that I'm sure that most of you are well uh, versed in and much better than I, but Mijuel et al performed a really nice study where they had um, some breast cancer survivors and they worked on um, uh, exercise intervention with high intensity aerobic training or resistance training and HIIT versus usual care. And I believe it was 12 to 16 weeks. This is just the usual care data showing that the percent change from pre-chemotherapy and fiber uh, cross-section area to type one uh, fibers is around 30, 35, 38% decreased uh, on chemotherapy, the percent uh, mouse and heavy chain um, Isoform type 1 fibers is around 30% lower. There's decreased capillarity and decreased citrate synthase. So we start talking about this diffusive conductance that I mentioned. Well, this, this capillarity fiber ratio is unequivocally going to affect your, your DMO2 as well as the myosteatosis, increasing the surface area that you have to diffuse oxygen. And again, this is going to impair the oxidative uh, capacity of the, of the muscle. They did find that aerobic training did improve or attenuate some of these declines. So in, in both aerobic and resistance training with HIT, uh, the decline in type one cross-sectional fiber area was less with those type of training. And uh, the capillarity or capillary fiber ratio was, was, was attenuated in, with both types of exercise training. And again, I'm not an expert in this area, but only aerobic training, resistance training prevented a decline in, 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 uh, in, in complex one, two, and four protein levels of electron transport chain that was found in the usual care group. So again, I'm kind of highlighting that the skeletal muscle is so important, I think, in our clinical populations in heart fair. HEFREF has been shown for a long time, but HEFPEF is sort of the last five to seven years has been this data saying, listen, we have to think outside the heart and look at the vascular, microvascular, and a particular skeletal muscle. Um, so I'll just, just uh, this is just a slide. Uh, Wes Tucker, was, uh, who was a nutritionist and an exercise physiologist, who trained with us in Texas. And um, if we look at this few studies that have been, been performed to date in HEFPEF, we can improve your pulmonary oxygen uptake. No study to date has shown that we improve exercise cardiac health. And the few studies to date were being our group and, and another group who's measured this and estimated AVO2, that seems to be where the improvement in, in VO2 has come from, somewhere in the periphery. We don't, so we may change your heart rate a little bit. Maybe they get a little stronger and the power up, it goes uh, up on a bike after exercise training, but unequivocally, we don't change stroke volume. LV chamber stiffness, Ben Levine has shown over and over again at the IEM that there's a sweet spot for time and age where we just can't change LV chamber stiffness and compliance. So around 40, 45 is that sweet spot where with training of a year, you can improve that. And over that, it's just too hard to do it and not potentially possible. And we do not unequivocally change that in our heart failure patients who've got reduced or preserved injection fraction. And this tau, the relaxation time for the mitral valve, aortic valve closure, mitral valve opening, we do not change that as well. Maybe there's some vascular improvements. Um, we've not seen any changes in endothelial function with exercise training and HEFPEF. And again, I can't tell you where the AVO2 is going up with exercise training because no one has really measured that. So again, a shout out to you guys to please <laughs> do some of this work because we, we really need more work. I can only tell you that somewhere in the periphery, there's an improvement, but we don't know where. But I would think obviously the oxidative fibers are going to increase. Capillarity has been shown to improve. Um, and DMO2 likely improves as well. 
So that kind of takes us now then, well, what about breast cancer? So, so what I'm getting at from this slide in the studies performed to date, it would suggest that non-cardiac peripheral factors are the major determinants of the improvement in pulmonary oxygen uptake with exercise training in heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. So uh, Steve Folks is uh, a postdoc working with us and Steve is an uh, outstanding, outstanding uh, trainee who's trained with Andre Lagursh at the Baker and Aaron Howden. And Steve had the uh, unique fortune that uh, we, we were able, our group, uh, to perform some research in the last uh, few years uh, with breast cancer, looking at exercise training and cardiac function. And Steve presented this as a late-breaking abstract at AHA on Monday at around 9 a.m. And uh, after his talk at 9.15, we had this paper published simultaneously with, uh, with um, circulation. And I, I really think it's important that trainees are able to present as well at these kind of seminars. So Steve's got about seven slides that he's going to present. So he led this trial, the Brexit trial, the good Brexit. And then now we'll just have a summary slide and maybe uh, we can take some questions and, and uh, have some good dialogue. But Steve, uh, why don't you go ahead with uh, the Brexit? Awesome. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark. And thanks for the, the introduction. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for, for hearing me present today. Um, so, so this was a, a study, as Mark alluded to, in, in breast cancer patients who were going through, through chemotherapy. And the outcomes that we were really interested in as part of this study that was published in CERC was firstly um, measuring the impact of exercise training on, on the prevalence of functional disability, which is this sort of threshold of peak oxygen uptake below 18 mils per kilogram that, that Mark had sort of talked about previously, that essentially represents the the metabolic requirements of independently performing daily living, which is which is a relatively common endpoint experienced by up to one in three breast cancer survivors after therapy. And so we measured this from, from VO2 peak using the sort of gold standard approach in cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, but on the right, you can see that we were also really interested in the impact of exercise training on specific measures of cardiac function due to the integrative nature of, of VO2 peak representing both cardiac and non-cardiac factors. Um, so we, we included resting uh, echocardiography measures of, of both systolic function in the form of left ventricular ejection fra fraction and a, a sort of more sensitive marker of that in the form of left ventricular um, GLS, which is longitudinal strain or essentially that longitudinal deformation Mark talked about earlier, um, as well as uh, resting markers of diastolic function. But really the key addition to this study was, was the incorporation of exercise uh, cardiac magnetic resonance images of, of cardiac function during exertion. And this really relates to this theory that if we really want to understand the causes of breathless and exercise intolerance, we need to see how the system responds to, to stress such as exertion. And so we included exercise CMR measures of, of hemodynamics in the form of cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate, as well as ejection fraction uh, from, from rest to peak supine exercise uh, in, in this form. Uh, cycling exercise while supine in the magnet. Um, and then Mark, if we can go to the next slide um, here, just let me move forward. Um, moving on to the, the results um, here in which, um, I guess the key things I've got highlighted here are to emphasize that, that this was a randomized study with, with 102 women um, altogether that were analyzed where, where really they were matched for, for age, um, and, and cardiotoxic therapy, so in the form of anthracycline-based chemotherapy, with a subset also undergoing additional cardiotoxic treatments such as uh, HER2-targeted therapy. Um, and, and overall, they were sort of quite well matched for baseline levels of, of, of fitness and represent this sort of middle-aged transition um, of, of breast cancer survivors. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. So what I didn't explain earlier was this was actually a 12 month study um, where women were randomized either into 12 months of structured exercise training or to usual care lifestyle advice to be physically active during therapy. Um, and we completed outcomes at four months, um, shortly, uh, shortly after completing the anthracycline component of their therapy. And then again, 12 months from baseline. And really what this slide is showing is our primary endpoint, which was the prevalence of functional disability between our exercise training relative to the usual care groups. And focusing first on the data at four months, you can see that training significantly attenuated the prevalence of disability by approximately, uh, or the odds of disability by approximately 70% uh, at four months. Um, and then shifting your attention now to the data at 12 months, you can see this attenuation appears similar 
um, but it's no longer statistically significant. And we think part of that may reflect, we did see uh, significantly greater attrition in the usual care group at the 12 month mark. And, and a number of these had actually become functionally disabled at the previous visits. And, and many of these participants who were functionally disabled didn't return for the final evaluation uh, a number of whom this was either due to ill health or, or despite reasonable encouragement, feeling too incapacitated to complete the, the assessment at 12 months. Now, the final thing I've got highlighted is just this black text box in the top right, um, which is the results from a pre-specified per protocol analysis that included only those exercise training participants who adhered to the, the intervention over the 12 month period. And really the key thing to focus on is the bold red text at the bottom in which you can see that that not a single exercise training uh, participant who was adherent was actually functionally disabled at the 12 month time point relative to one in five usual care participants. And so if we can move to the next slide here, this is basically taking, in, instead of looking at functional disability as a binary outcome like we did in the previous slide, but now looking at functional capacity as a continuum in the form of peak oxygen uptake, we can see that firstly in the red line, exercise training over 12 months was associated with a significant 8% improvement in oxygen uptake over that period, um, which is in stark contrast to the trajectory seen with usual care participants in which uh, oxygen uptake declined and was 7% below uh, baseline values even at 12 months. And, and really highlighted in red on the far right is that this resulted in a 3.5 mil per kilogram or or in other terms, a one metabolic equivalent difference between the two groups at, at 12 months, which is a really important clinical threshold that has been associated with clinically meaningful differences in both uh, heart failure incidence and, and longevity um, with, with further time. And so if we can move to the next slide, this is probably one of the really key and most interesting findings from our study, which essentially provides the mechanistic link between changes in exercise capacity and changes in cardiac function in the setting of both chemotherapy and exercise training. And really this is because we looked at cardiac function, not just at rest, but during exertion. So the three panels you see here show the, the hemodynamic responses from rest right up to peak exercise for both groups at, at baseline, which is the sort of faded dotted line, and then at 12 months, which is the solid, uh, solid colored lines. And the first thing to highlight though, is that if we were to only look at the resting changes in resting values over the 12 months, we would have seen no impact uh, of exercise training on, on cardiac function. Um, but uh, the key point is that with exertion, by measuring the response up to peak exercise, we see clear differences with an impact of exercise training in which both cardiac output and stroke volume augmentation with exercise was significantly increased relative to baseline with the exercise training groups, relative to usual care, which declined over the same time point. Moving on to the, the next slide, when we, we look at the ejection fraction response to exercise, which is basically representing how well the, the ventricle can sort of squeeze down and, and contract in response to exercise and, and sort of is basically the marker to determine preserved versus reduced ejection fraction in a way. Um, once again, if we were to rely on resting measures, both groups sort of decreased a little bit at rest, um, but there was no, no difference in, in resting ejection fraction between the group, two groups, which could be inferred to suggest there was no effective exercise training. But once again, when we look at the response to exertion by looking rest to peak exercise augmentation, we see that exercise training in the solid red line had significantly increased augmentation relative to the usual care group at 12 months. This final slide is basically, uh, if we can just go back uh, one mark is, is essentially showing the exact same thing, but in this case with the standard of care measures that would be used to denote uh, cardiotoxicity and, and basically show that if we once again look at cardiac function at rest, we would have seen no impact of exercise training and, and provide no insight into reduced exercise capacity in this cohort. Um, so if we move on to the last slide is basically the sort of four key takeaways from the study. Um, which was the exercise training during breast cancer therapy results in clinically meaningful differences in, in fitness. Uh, in those who do it consistently, it, it, it reduces functional disability. Um, when we use measures of cardiac function during exertion, we see this is partly due to improved cardiac function, which actually declines with usual care. And really the, the key takeaway is that the current standard of care approach to looking at, at changes in cardiac function at rest is insensitive to both changes in exercise capacity and, and beneficial effects of exercise training. Um, so all interesting sort of findings, I think, but you know, the key thing I haven't been talking about here is muscle and that's really the other 
question we're looking to, to address. We've got some data collected, but, but also that's what we're looking to work on with some of the mark, uh, some of the work uh, I'm doing with Mark moving forward as well. Thanks, Steve. So I guess in summary of the talk from, from, from my slides and Steve's is that, you know, both HFPEF and breast cancer are, are major healthcare issues. Uh, and importantly, breast cancer survivors, especially the older survivor with early stage disease where a tumor has not spread, they, 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 they have face an important new set of healthcare challenges. In particular, HFPEF is a leading cause of mortality in, in older survivors. Uh, both HFPEF and breast cancer survivors are very similar in one regard. They have reduced exercise talks, and not all, but many that we've studied. It seems that if you're in Vancouver or in Melbourne, the fitness is higher. So clearly there's some, some uh, regional differences and ability to get out and exercise, unlike Edmonton, where now we're locked in until next June with snow. Um, but it seems that the limitations are, are in, in pulmonary oxygen uptake, at least are related to cardiac and non-cardiac factors with the latter, I think, playing a little bit more important role and exercise training can improve peak VO2. And, and from Steve's work and, and our work with Andre at the Baker, it seems that we may improve exercise cardiac function, uh, but not in half path. So I'll uh, just wanna thank all of our collaborators for these types of research. We'll have other collaborators, but specifically germane to this work in Canada and the US, and as well as in Australia and, and Germany, and then some funding that we've received over the years from NIH. CHR, the MAS, and, and the Texas uh, STARS program for, for my lab, and I was there. So I think we have probably uh, <laughs> 10 minutes left uh, if there's any questions. And if they're mitochondrial, David, you're going to answer them, we agreed. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I hope this is uh, something that you uh, were, uh, your group's interested in. And uh, um, yeah, no, uh, this was great. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, Steve, also for the last study. That's great. Um, you know, uh, you're speaking about the periphery and, and that's the source of improvement for VO2. Uh, just let me say to the audience that if you have a question, let's go, uh, please through the Q&A uh, option here on your screen, please type your question into Q&A and I will reread the question for either Mark or Steve. Uh, and you're, please go ahead and, and type those in. Uh, meanwhile, while I wait for that, I'll just um, ask a couple myself. Uh, so, you know, this mitochondrial problem can be solved if you want to send us some biopsies. We can yeah. <laughs> take care of that for you, Mark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how easy it is to, to do that but uh, for you. But anyway, I'm certainly willing to help if, if you're interested in that avenue. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, we used to have Gord Bell was here. I don't, I don't know if anyone phys ed is taking biopsies right now, but I, yeah, clearly that, that, that could solve a number of our problems. And that's where we kind of got away from this type of research and using the magnet, but uh, yeah, yeah well, it's, it's just, often, yeah, we just, sometimes with these studies, we've got like a day to get everything done because they're getting chemo, but in long-term survivor, we would have time and, I, and the long-term survivor who I'm very interested in, because these are the women who in our hands, at least in the South, but we've we've got a number of these women here in Edmonton who their VO2s are like a half path. They're a heart failure VO2, but they have no heart failure. But to me, I don't, I'm, it doesn't matter. Like they have heart failure, the vasculature and the muscles, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we, we're worried about that group. And um, yeah, we, we, we need to uncouple why that is. And yeah, no, uh, just an option to, to consider. If you want yeah. any help, just let me know. Definitely. Um, yeah, so I just want clarity before I go to the Q and A. Yeah. I've got some questions popping up. So uh, in Steve's talk, he mentioned that heart function was improved with training. There was an improvement in cardiac output, stroke volume, yeah. projection fraction. But I, yeah. I thought I heard you say, Mark, that in yours uh, or your previous work, the improvement that led to an increase in VO two max was not due to a change yeah. in 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 heart function, but rather in the periphery. So yeah. were they different populations or different ages? Yeah. Or yeah, that's a great question. So so I should clarify that. So in the studies that we've done in heart failure and preserved ejection fractions, so now they actually have clinical diagnosis of heart failure with preserved. Mm -hmm. Again, there's only been about five studies to date. Mm -hmm. Only a few have measured some hemodynamics. In that setting, no change in cardiac output at all. So if we just use the FIC principle, it's, it seems to be there's greater oxygen extraction. So in the breast cancer, Steve's is the first to really measure the hemodynamics ever, pre-post training. 
uh, and it's the first to show. But in older women, even when we did some work in the past, and I don't know the literature that well now, but even in healthy older women, we don't often see changes in peak exercise cardiac output, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so in HEFPEF, no. In heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, Rainier Hambrick and Andy Coates, so in Germany and in, in, in the UK, there have been some signals that they improve cardiac output, but it seems to relate to improvements in vascular function, so the heart's not as loaded. The heart's probably not contracting as well, but in pure hef pef, no cardiac signal for improvement. It's all periphery, however we define periphery from that fit. Right. Breast cancer, this is the first study to measure that and show. So I, we're yeah, so so two different populations. But yeah. it's interesting. So it's a really great question because I believe there's stage B. So maybe they're intermediate before getting heart failure that we can change that. Or secondly, they were in that sweet spot range. Yeah. But, so what's, but, what's, but the hearts are smaller though. So they're stiffer. So did we make the heart less compliant? Can't say. We didn't measure that. Yeah. Um, it's hard to make hearts that are stiff, less, less, more compliant, less stiff. So yes. um, yeah, so you're correct in the sense that you, yeah, yeah. The HEFPEF, no. The breast cancer, who I think are future HEFPEF, yes, from the end of one study. Okay. So that leads me very quickly to one small question. That is, at what stage can training at stage B, stage C, stage D, those are stage C and D are not going to be changed by training. Maybe with stage B, would cardiac function improve with training in that, in that, at that stage? Yeah. Yes. I think if you look at Ben's data, if you're under 50, oh. Okay. For, for, for stiffness as our surrogate. But again, at what age can we improve vascular function? Probably maybe into older age, um, but but actual cardiac performance, yes, in stage B, uh, if, they're, if they're middle-aged, yes, yeah. I okay. think so. But when you have established heart failure, it's pretty hard, it's really hard to change hearts that are dysfunctional. Yeah. Gotcha. And I think we focus so much on this thick principle when we say AVO2 is normal that we say, oh, it's, it's not a peripheral problem. <laughs> That's right. wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understood. Okay, three questions from the uh, Q&A. Heather Edgel is asking, uh, saying, thank you very much for your talk. Your discussion of the smaller hearts and stroke volume struck me as interesting from an yeah. orthos orthostatic tolerance point of view. Do you know <laughs> if the half path patients were prone to fainting or POTS earlier in life? Yeah. Oh, that's a great, yeah. Uh, so A, I can't answer that question earlier in life. Um, the second trouble we have with the HEFPEF, you know, they're beta blocked, they're on an ACE. So to what extent is it now the small? So it's really interesting that Heather asked that. I, I can't answer that. But but it's old. No one talks about the HEFPEF patient with a smaller heart. We only talk, we think of heart failure, you've got to have this big heart, but up to a quarter of patients have heart failure with a smaller, stiffer heart. So it's, it's, it's really not well studied and yeah. hemodynamically, no, but they would be, they would, yes, if you st stand up quickly and the, e the end diastolic um, elastance and stiffness is high and you have no ESV reserve, if those bar receptors don't kick in, you're going to faint. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so it, it also depends on our heart failure patients if they're wet or dry, uh, because we see that with the heart failure, they're either stable, they're sinking in the ocean with jugular venous distension and pulmonary rails, and they're full of fluid, or they're diuresis now with diuretic and Lasix, and they're really dry. I'd really worry about the dry heart failure patient with a small heart, because believe it or not, as uh, they need a high LA pressure, because when you've got a stiff ventricle, you met you got to push, right? As opposed right. to a sucker with diastolic suction, they're pushers. So in the setting of small heart and dry, you, you do have to worry about the orthostatic intolerance unequivocally. Okay. Next question by Omar. I was wondering about the VO2 percentages where basic tasks like sweeping the floor took up a huge percent. Does that mean that the exercise assigned to these patients is generally insufficient and they need to be pushed more or is the opposite true? I, 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 uh, I'm biased. Uh, a, I think they need to be doing way more strength training. <laughs> and secondly, if your VO2 is 
you need to do a lot of intervals because that's how you're living, right? If you're 59, you can't do 40 minutes of aerobic on a bike unless it's 10 watts. So, right, like again, 59, I mean, sitting down doing nothing is 50% and putting your clothes on is 60. So if you say go to 60, so in rehab, we always say, oh, start off low and go slow. Well, your rehab for 40 minutes is take your shirt on, put your shirt on, take your, well, that's not rehab. So we actually think you should do higher intensity, but it's high intensity relative to your low fitness, not Lance Armstrong, 500 watts. Yeah. It's like 25 watts for a minute on, a couple minutes off. But we can really model that because we can measure your on and off kinetics in the plantar flexure. And we could actually tell people, we could phenotype what type of training you should do based on your, if we did knee extension or plantar flexion or even whole body, we could do that. We could actually tell you what interval you should do based on your pulmonary or muscle off kinetics. We can model the towel and say for that person, you can go back to the next boat in 62 seconds where we've had some patients that take five minutes for their off kinetics to come back to rest. They can't do another boat quickly. Right, but, right, right. but I think, I think when your VO2 is low relative, you need to do, you need to do training as you're living, which is little brief bursts of interval or yeah. weight train, right? <laughs> Cause no, Russ Heppel, and I think you guys have shown, if you take an octogenarian and only do strength train, you eat increased citrate synthase, Capillary fiber ratio, I think Russ showed that went up and near Maria Fiatoroni and Walter Fontira. So even strengthening is the key. And we find that with our obese heft pass. When your BMI is 50, it's hard to walk in a treadmill. Yeah. Because yeah, you're yeah. holding this body mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have suspected hip training for this population, but you've convinced me, I guess, that that's maybe. A Not Lance Armstrong hit, but hit relative to your low peak VO2. Right, right, right. Okay. Peter Bax uh, says, nice talk, Mark and Steve. Is it not true that half puff is invariably associated with lung congestion induced with exercise? How to deal with this in your exercise studies? So we're doing a study with Ben Levine right now where you know, we have a program project grant right before I left Texas. So we're phenotyping every, everything you can imagine. Um, no, you know, what's really funny is that, um, the, so, so what is a half puff? Some are obese. Some are COPD years, some have chronic renal disease. It's kind of choose your phenotype. But in our hands, um, the, the lymphatics must be great because they actually could, they, yeah, they, they, they do, yeah. S some are short of breath, mm -hmm. but most of mine that I've studied are muscles, the major factor. So I think that if, if lymphatics have remodeled and they can tolerate those filling pressures, they actually do okay. They're not, I, I, I know, yeah. We've, we've got right heart calf in, 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 in Ben's study, the PPG, and, and you know we get, we get high filling pressures, but they tolerate it not too bad because they have high filling pressures when they're putting their clothes on, when they walk up a flight of stairs. Mm -hmm. So we just, we just monitor. Well, the, the key is, I think I should qualify this. I think you need to do high intensity training, but you need to do high intensity training of one limb at a time. So part of the PPG, we're doing knee extensor training. One group never gets aerobic training on a bike or a treadmill. They only do single isolated knee extensor training. So now the dyspnea is not a factor because it's such a small muscle mass. And then I think you should do your calves and your arms and you've trained the whole body at a higher intensity. And when you get back on the bike, your VO2 actually goes up. And Salt Team showed that 20 years ago. So are there documented, last question, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end, but... Are there documented, is there a documented prescription that you're describing? It seems like it's a very, very specialized prescription for this population. For no, actually. because every, every organization, ACSM, AHA, they all say the token 60 to 80%, yeah. you know, but Steve, I'll maybe let you answer that because Steve's training was absolutely unique. And maybe Steve, again, this is breast cancer, not HFPEF, but I think this is the group that we can actually change. So Steve, maybe just hot because it wasn't like continuous. So if you just have a minute, Steve, why don't you highlight the sort of meso cycles and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we actually kind of adapted what what to an athlete would be a relatively standard kind of periodization model, which rather than giving everyone the same type of training that just progressively gets harder over 12 months is we actually sort of took this notion that, you know, the, the physiology underlying VO2 peak and cardiac and muscle adaptations is, you know, based on a number of different stimuli. So we included 
you know, a couple of sort of um, moderate intensity uh, sort of tempo sessions just below their ventilatory threshold. We included one to two sort of high intensity interval sessions a week. And then we also threw in, you know, a longer endurance session on say on the weekend, as well as a recovery session, which, which sort of uh, did progressively increase over the 12 months of the study. But the other sort of factor in is just like an athlete needs to periodize their training program based on competition and, you know, other life stresses is, is at the end of the day with cancer treatment, you have these regular dosages of chemotherapy and surgery and radiotherapy. And so we also sort of progressed, particularly the intensity of training to sort of coincide with days where, you know, for example, if they had the chemotherapy on Monday, usually on Tuesday or Wednesday, they're actually feeling, you know, if, if anything over the moon, because they've had a good dose of prednisolone. Um, and, and so we do high intensity interval training on that day. And then sort of the side effects start to build up over the next three to seven days. And so we then drop the intensity to sort of preempt them feeling nauseous and fatigued and, and et cetera. And, and then as the side effects start to wean off, we then progressively overload the intensity so that they can then uh, have a, a training stimulus to, to respond to. And, and we did get quite good uh, uh, adherence uh, over the 12 months with that, with that approach. Right, right, right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Good explanation. Okay, uh, we should end there given the time uh, and uh, the knowledge that you're going to carry on with some of our audience here in just a second. So I want to thank Mark very much and Steve for joining in as well. Stay with me, Mark and Steve. Uh, uh, Seminar is over, folks. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you at the next event in a couple of weeks.